All right, so this is uh, tips for learning original languages. And so the handout there is just for you to kind of keep some notes on. Um, any of you have any official Greek or Hebrew training? See, you would, because the seminary. Uh, you're getting some now. <laughs> and have you had any sort of, oh, okay. Well, um, not in this so, life. Not in this <laughs> life, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so kind of, you know, it, myself, you know, I went to Bible school down in, in Pensacola, Florida. And part of the ministerial program, I had to take two years of, of Greek. And, and I struggled with it many times as you, know, you hear the stories. And then, you know, the question that comes when you finish your second year Greek, are you going to take Hebrew? And, you know, the horror stories uh, that you hear about Hebrew. And so if you think Greek is bad, Hebrew is even worse. And so sometimes we kind of get scared away uh, from the languages. And, you know, besides that is, you know, you look at the Hebrew letters. I mean, it just looks like a bunch of scribbling marks and dots and everything. And Greek, at least a little bit, some of the letters do look like, you know, at least the alpha somewhat looks like an A, you know. And a gamma look kind of well, maybe a little bit like a G or, you know. So it, it we kind of, and, and so it, it can be very daunting and actually be kind of scary. So if I were to try to go back to Bible school today and to take a lot of Hebrew training or whatever, I don't know if I could do it. You know, part of it is time. I got a family. I'm a pastor of a church, and and so it can be it can be kind of a difficult thing, and especially being away from you know college for quite a few years now, uh, it can be kind of hard. I'll say this: you don't have to be a master of Greek or of Hebrew to be able to understand concepts of, of original language. So Genesis chapter 11, I think, is a really interesting passage of scripture. Uh, this is <clears throat> the confusion of languages. This is the Tower of Babel. I think there's a few things that can be very helpful when it comes to, to grammar um, that, that we can learn from the passage of scripture. So in verse 1, you know, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. So interestingly, language and then what is pointed out the same words uh, there in verse 1, okay? And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all the same language. <clears throat> and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad uh, from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building a city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad uh, over the face of the whole earth. So when we think about language, um, different languages or dialects, um, the confusion of language was actually not the creation of new languages that never existed before. Uh, it was actually a uh, mixing together, to pouring together, and when it talks about the language and things, it refers to the lips, and the lips are used in the sounds of words. All human languages go back to one language, and the difference that came about was in the way that, that words are being pronounced. So when you look at like Greek, within the family of Greek, uh, you also have Latin. And what we call representation of sounds is that you can understand that this word in Greek, when you understand representation of sounds, or what they call philology of language, you can understand Latin and these words are related. They, they have the same root meaning of things. And it all goes back to one, one language. What I think is, is also interesting 
is in chapter uh, 10, well, what it refers to in chapter 10, verse 5, is that where they settled, there were families of languages. So they, they're related. Uh, so you have that uh, within different parts of, of the earth. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, there was one language, but now you have many different dialects. And it's more than just, I think, the words that they had, but the language goes just as much to grammar. I would submit to you, grammatically, all languages are related to one another. There are some differences, but I believe that the basic concepts of grammar and of words still remain the same. So I will say this, if you can understand English grammar, you can understand the grammar of other languages. Because the concepts are, are related, the concepts are the same. So when we talk about you know, verbs in English, there's a lot of relationship between verbs in Greek and Hebrew. There are some differences as the languages became confused, but rules of grammar uh, are very, very helpful. And, and so if you can understand English grammar or English syntax, with that understanding of those concepts, you can read and understand Hebrew and Greek language. Uh, doesn't mean you may not pronounce it perfectly or, you know, but direct objects, direct objects are across all languages, verbs, subjects, those sorts of things cut across whatever the language may be. And so we don't have to be someone who goes to two years of Greek and another year of Hebrew. I think that we can take English concepts of grammar and read in Hebrew books, grammar books, and read in Greek books uh, uh, about the concepts of language and be able to understand it. And so, uh, you know, we don't have to be afraid. Now, the hard part does come when you read Hebrew and Greek grammars, they're going to give you words in there and sentences as examples. And, and so there is some things there, but you can actually read grammars and, and understand the concept that they are trying to explain with the example. And, and I think that is, is a very important thing when we understand the origin of languages. I think it also includes the grammatical structure as well. So, sentence structure, um, I think, is, is, is very, very important. So, all languages um, have different parts of speech. Verbs, nouns prepositions, etc. And how that those parts of speech function in a sentence. So nouns can be subjects or direct objects or indirect objects. Object of the preposition. Uh, how we, we look at the sentence structure, uh, the parts of speech cut across all languages. And so if you can understand what English prepositions and prepositional phrases do as how they modify things, guess what? You're going to get the same thing in Greek. You're going to get the same thing in Hebrew. So when it comes to uh, languages and syntax, we're talking about subjects, predicates, phrases, clauses, etc. So in English, we can take a sentence and you can have an a independent clause joined with a dependent clause. Well, guess what? Greek does the same thing. Hebrew does the same thing. And, and so understanding English uh, and, and will, that grammar will help you with the other languages as well. So what do we do? And so we have kind of a grease board here. Not, there's not a lot of room. But when it comes to English grammar, where do we always begin? So if you're going to take a sentence uh, and, and you're going to tear it apart, well, actually before the subject, the verbs. They always start with the verbs. So if you remember when it came to, to grammar, uh, you always had you know, the verb. You always start with the verb. Once you find the verb, you ask the question, who or what is doing the action? And that's your subject. And then from there, once you have this, now everything breaks off into direct object, indirect objects, prepositions. And so, for example, if you were to, to use uh, the sentence, uh, you know, the wisdom of God. 
This is not a sentence anyway. The wisdom of God is when used from above. How's that? Okay. So what we know is there's our verb. That's actually a state of being verb as opposed to an action verb. But you, you start with, with the is. And then uh, of the wisdom of God. We'll say it that way. So the subject is what? Wisdom. So there's your wisdom. And then from there are modifiers. You have the. So you have an article, and that's going to come across here because it acts as an adjective. And then you have the, the wisdom. This is wisdom here. And you have a prepositional phrase of God, which acts like a modifier of God. So if you know English, actually, the Greek is the same way. But when we talk about wisdom, we ask the question, uh, when it comes to you know, of God, we kind of call that a genitive in, in Greek. It's kind of the same, it's a prepositional phrase, but it is descriptive. So what we would say is, is okay, is it the wisdom who is, which is from God or origin of God? Uh, is it the wisdom of God in the sense that it is godly wisdom? And, and so you have to make that determination, but if you understand that prepositions are like adjectives and describe why it's the same thing in Greek. And you can read about what we call the genitive and say, okay, which one is it? Is it produced by God? Is it the origin of God? Is it about God? Is it uh, a, a godly wisdom? Which one is it? But English grammar, you can compare it to what you have in Greek or, or what you have in Hebrew. So we begin with the verb, then get the subject. We get then the direct object, and everything else basically from that point are modifiers. And you can have phrases and clauses that kind of go along with the whole thing that build off it. But English skills, English grammar skills, if you have those, uh, you, can, you can understand Hebrew and you can understand Greek, how those things, things are working. So we begin with, with that of, of sentence structure. So there's some peculiarities that I want to be able to look at that are differences when you look at English uh, versus Greek or, or even of Hebrew. And this is one of the big differences is verbs. All right. <clears throat> so when we use verbs in English, we always look at it from the perspective of time. Time is the dominant thing. So, uh, you know, present tense, past tense, future tense, perfect tense, we have, have those in English, and we, in our language, look at it from a time perspective. Greek and Hebrew actually focus on two kinds of action, two aspects of action. Uh, the first one is that of the kind of action, and that is actually what is dominant. So when we talk about Verbs in, in English, we say time is the dominant feature. Uh, in Greek and Hebrew, the kind of action is primary. Secondary is the time of action. Okay? Let's take a look at this in, in a passage of scripture with the Hebrew. Uh, Psalm 105. So Psalm number 105. <clears throat> so Psalm 105, um, as we, we look at this psalm, uh, <clears throat> as we, we kind of look at this here, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, uh, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, uh, sing to him, and uh, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his faith continually. Remember his works which he has done, his marvels and his judgments uttered by his mouth, O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in the earth. He Okay, and here's the verse I want to focus on. Verse 8. He has remembered his covenant forever. Uh, as you look at the Lord remembering, he has remembered his covenant forever. We would look at that as being past tense. He remembered in, in the past. 
in Hebrew, with verbs, the action, the kind of action, takes precedent. And there's two tenses. We call it the perfect tense, or completed action, and the incomplete uh, act tense, which is called the imperfect. It's kind of the idea of in process. So something that is completed versus something that is incomplete. So you have the perfect and the imperfect. Here's the thing. We have it translated as remembered. But if you look through the verses, he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, while well, not mentioned, oh, Joseph is mentioned uh, in here, how, how that he was in prison and God brought him out of there. And then you go several generations to Moses. And what Psalm 105 is all about is God's covenant faithfulness. Well, God remembered, if we say, well, that's a past tense. Well, wait one second, it spans several generations. How can God... So what we have, in, in what we call this, is a perfect tense. And, and what that means is, yes, God remembered, he established his covenant in the past, but the ongoing results is that he continues to remember. We put it as a past tense, but as we look here in the verse, literally, I think what he's saying is, God remembers his covenant, and notice the next part, forever. So if it's only a time perspective that God remembered in the past, then how did he remember past tense but forever? <laughs> kind of weird. See that grammar there? So the point that he's trying to say is, is God continues to remember. But within the text of Scripture, what it's saying is God at one point in the past, he made this covenant. But continually and ongoing, he continues to remember that covenant. And in response to it, he shows his faithfulness. Why wouldn't it be translated that way? That right. He remembers his covenant. And, and here's the thing. In English, when we translate things, English, as we said, is a time-first language. Whereas in Hebrew, it is the type of action. And it is usually the context that will help you understand so English, we kind of say there's past, there's present, there's future. Those are the basic ones that we look at. In, in the Hebrew, a completed action could encompass what we call the past. It could encompass the future. And it could encompass a little bit of both, what we call the perfect. Something happened in the past with kind of the ongoing results. In prophecy, and this is the big thing in prophecy, how many times is the past tense used in relation to God's prophecy concerning Israel? But yet, it's talking about the kingdom which has not occurred yet. Because within the prophecy of the Hebrew, the completed action is telling you, you can bank on it. Because it's about the, the kind of action first, rather than the, the time of the action. So you may have a completed a verb in Hebrew that, and they translate it with past tense in English, but it's actually a future tense because it hasn't occurred yet, but it's assured. So you can see that the time or the type, I'm sorry, the type or the kind of action takes precedence over the time. It, it, so we have three, you know, past, present, future. Hebrew has only two, completed and incomplete, but yet Future could be incomplete, or it could be completed action. It's, it's really kind of weird from an English mindset, the kind of action. Because we think, first of all, of time. But in both Greek and Hebrew, it is looked at from the type of action. Your question, I think, why the translator... See, the translators know all this. So they have to choose. Yeah. They're going to use the English past tense... Mm -hmm. Or the present. If they use the present yes, tense, it would limit it right. too much. Yeah, it's in our, we would read it differently. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect tense. But uh, mm -hmm. it I does imply it that what it, you know, remembers. Right. So, but it would I'm take too many words like to make sure you don't think that this is something that he's still doing because he's really got it all done. But it just covers a bit of period of time. The concepts makes the actual it's, that's where the language so becomes a yeah. tricky thing. 
from like the aspect instead of tense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and actually, so I, see, I'm the ESV. Interested in this because it's time to start I'm teaching kids. I have the yeah. ESV. It actually it's too smart. Numbers. numbers. Oh. So it depends on the translation. He needs to go further. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know. I, I think if if you can really understand English concepts. That I think goes a long ways towards equating how it is with Greek and Hebrew. But he calls me and his mother grammar Nazis. I'm not sure. Why. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing actually. That's a good term. <laughs> so let's let's take a look at this in one more place. Uh, now this time we're going to look at Greek. Okay, so Romans chapter eight. Grammar Nazis. I have to remember that one. Okay, so Romans chapter eight. <clears throat> so. As we, we think about, you know, um, in Greek, the kind of action takes precedence over the time of action. And so let's take a look, and, and this is a, a great passage of scripture. Uh, let's take a look at, at verse uh, 29. Um, this all, is all the idea of God working all things together uh, for those who love God, to those who are thee called according to purpose. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn of many, many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those, uh, and these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Each one of these verbs, as you notice, are translated as past tense. What is interesting, I think there's a time element to it, uh, but all of them in Greek are what we call an aorist tense. And it refers to completed action. Here's the thing. Our glorification has not occurred yet. But it is looked at from the action of a completed event already. How can that be the case? Because God did this work all at the same time. It's assured for us. It's a completed act. And so we translate the aorist tense in English as a past tense. But the kind of action is only saying it's completed. But it has not occurred yet. So from an English perspective, we would say, okay, God in the past did this, but it hasn't occurred. So we would use future tense. But the kind of action is what is taking precedence in this passage of scripture. So, yes. So, in other words, like, it's, <clears throat> the writer's trying to emphasize that this is something that is going to happen. It is, it's a done deal. Yes. Okay. It's a completed act. God has completed the act of our glorification. But, however, though, that's the, the kind of action. If you were to, to make it future, if future to us in English means the time is the most important thing. If you make time the most important thing, then guess what? Our bodies are already glorified. Well, I don't know. My body is still dealing with the effects of sin, you know. And, and Romans still talks about we groan within ourselves right now. But the point of, of the Greek with the, the kind of action, yes, the time element is there. God determined the past, but what is dominant is that it's a completed act. It's the kind of action being done. So it's really kind of weird to understand from an English mindset, because we're so tuned into time, 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 and the time spectrum. But it's about the kind of action. So when you read, you know, Greek and Hebrew, kind of keep that understanding. And that, that probably is one of the more difficult things. I actually think the Hebrew, because it's only completed and incomplete, um, whereas Greek has, you know, aorist, um, present tense, future tense, perfect tense, pluperfect, um, future perfect. I don't know all the, all, it's, yeah, all of them. That it, it's 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 a totally different type of mindset. But understand, you know, verbs are a little bit different, and and so understand those sorts of things. I know this is hard, um, but I hope those two examples kind of show you. The kind of action takes precedence before time of action. Um, when we also talk about verbs uh, in, you know, like Greek or Hebrew, but especially in Greek more than anything else, uh, we take 
Oh yeah, use that. Okay, so we take we we take a verb in Greek, and what we do in English when we say the wisdom of of God, uh, you know, wisdom is the subject. But what do you do if it's about a person? Uh, let's say you know he uh, led people out of Egypt, right? We're talking about Moses. Well, we would say, here's our verb, led. So we'd put led here. He is the subject we put here. We have two words. So two words, we separate those two out. In Greek, you can look at a verb, and the verb may contain the subject. So there's five parts of what we call to a Greek verb. There's tense, voice, mood, person, and number. So when we say tense, we talk about present tense, past tense, future tense. When we talk about voice, there's three parts to voice. There's active, there's passive, and there is middle, kind of in between. What that means in Greek is how does the action relate to the subject? So, I'm going to use baseball as an example, okay? The active voice would be this. The batter hit the ball. The batter, the subject, he's actively doing the action. He hit the ball. How about this? The batter was hit by the ball. The batter is still the subject, but he's receiving the action. He was hit by the ball. So what do we call that? Hit by the pitch. He was hit by the pitch. Okay, And then the next one, the batter hit himself with the ball. So what does that mean? He fouled the ball off his foot. So the action, the, the subject is not only doing the action, but he's receiving the action. It's kind of the middle between the two. So there is that type of voice that we call it in the Greek language. Active, passive, and middle. The next part that we have is what we call mood. And that has to do with certain stages of reality or possibility. And so what the, the, the sense is uh, with a uh, mood, uh, we'd say like something like, you know, uh, aorist, active, um, imperative or something. So the idea is that is it a actual action being done or is it the potential for things? And we won't get into a lot. I know that's kind of weird. Uh, but you know, we want to do some reading, reading on that. And then what you have is person. And what we mean by that is, is it first person? Is it second person? Or is it third person? So he led the people would be third person. Whereas I led the people is first person. And then you led the people is what we call second person. So looking at the verb, you don't always have a subject stated. Sometimes it's actually part of one of the five parts of the verb. So it's either first, second, or third person. And then you have number, and that's either single or plural. So the, plur the single of I, the plural is we. The single you, the plural of that is, we would say in English, you. Or if you're down south, you would say y'all. <laughs> okay? And then the third person would be he, she, or it. And, ver and, and that basically, that's kind of being there, whether it's first, second, or third person. The plural of he is, well, all of them would be them, or actually it can also be it as well. Uh, but you have the plural of that. Uh, so you, you kind of have that there in, in verbs. So when you look at English, we see the subject, which is a different word from the, the verb. But in Greek, the verb has a whole bunch of different parts. And there may not be a different subject. There could be another word that's a subject. But it may not have another word as a subject, which means the verb has the subject contained in it as one of its parts. So that is, is one of the kind of a couple of the unique things uh, that we, when we talk about verbs uh, in Greek or Hebrew, and that just takes some reading 
and just keep reading and reading and, and try to understand that. Um, it's not easy. Um, but if you can have a good understanding of English, you can, you can do a pretty good job uh, in, in just reading about Greek and Hebrew uh, when you have that there. <clears throat> the next one uh, is when we talk about nouns. So we'll just talk about nouns real quickly. <clears throat> what we talk about in, with nouns, we talk about cases. Subject, direct object, indirect object, object of the preposition. We, we talk about how nouns are used in a sentence. And that is, is the same way with Greek and Hebrew. Uh, they have cases. Hebrew is a little bit more simplistic than Greek is, uh, but the nouns all correspond to a case. So here it is. What we call the subject in English, in Greek, it is called the nominative case. Okay? Uh, when you have what we call the direct object and how that functions in a sentence, uh, in Greek it's called the accusative. So when you see these words, understand they may use a different name, but the concept in English is still the same. Direct object, accusative. Uh, subjects of the sentence, nominative. So understand that there may be different labels for nouns in their cases, but the concept is the same. Uh, so when we say the batter hit the ball, the direct object is what was hit? The ball. The ball was hit. Well, when you understand the direct object, it's limiting the scope of, of what was hit. Why Greek does the same thing. The accusative is what we call limitation. It's kind of limiting down the reception of, of the, the action. It can be very kind of confusing. But the idea is understand, even though there's just a different name for the noun case, the concept from English to Greek to Hebrew is, is really the same. And you can understand how those work together. Uh, a lot of times in prepositional phrases of God, um, in Greek, we, in English we call that a prepositional phrase. And it can be used to describe, describe a noun. Interestingly, in, in Greek, uh, when we talk about you know, the prepositions and the prepositional phrase, oftentimes the way we translate a prepositional phrase as describing is what is called a genitive. So the word of God, uh, you have uh, logos theou, and so it's word of God. Well, the of God, we put of in there because genitives are descriptive. In English, Prepositional phrases are descriptive. Now, there are actual prepositions in English and in Greek as well, but oftentimes we throw that preposition of to explain the Greek part, the genitive, or it's descriptive in some sort of way. So different names, but the concepts are still the same. And so if you can understand English, the concepts of things, then when you take a Greek syntax book, a grammar book, and you start to read about the nominative case, wow, well, right, that's something I've never known, but I don't understand any. Well, no, just understand that's your subject in English. Ah, oh, I get that now. So we can, we can see that there. So understand different names for nouns in their cases, but however though, there is uh, uh, just a different label, that's all it is, but the concept is, can be very well understood. All right, that's kind of all that I have as far as going over. I wanted to leave plenty of time uh, to be able to ask questions. So we get about 16 minutes. Any questions you may have? I know we kind of we didn't go over everything, and it's too much uh, to go over. But I want you to understand: just concepts in English have equivalents in the other languages. It's just a matter of reading and understand the equivalents in it. But there are some unique things as we kind of look at. Especially verbs. That's that's the hardest one. If you get that down, you're in pretty good shape. Okay, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Again, with reference to my purpose, which would be teaching Caleb mm -hmm. or or anybody, uh, when I learned, excuse me, when I was taught Greek. Yeah. <laughs> whether I learned it or not is a different issue. When I was taught Greek, uh, vocabulary was first. Yes. What do you think about what should go first? 
I, I think vocabulary is important because when you start getting into the Greek grammar, if, if you don't know the words and, and how the, you know, if you don't understand them, well, I, I think understanding the cases is important just as much as the vocabulary and how that the, the vocab changes with Greek, so whether it's genitive or it's accusative, the endings of it. So you're going to learn how it functions in the sentence differently. Um, I found that I think learning both at the same time is important. So that they're not just learning the vocab, but I think also learning grammar at the same time is, is helpful. Now, the words that they learn from vocabulary, I think, need to be reflective in the concept that they're learning. So that helps them. And so most of your manuals, your Greek grammar books and stuff, usually it always begins with like eight or ten words that you need to learn the meaning of. But then when they then they start teaching a concept in that lesson as well, and they'll use a lot of those words in it. So I think you have to use them both simultaneously. I think if, if, if all it is is, okay, let's learn our 200 Greek words first, and then we'll get to grammar, I, I think it's, you, you kind of learn those simultaneously. Um, I guess, I, I, don't know if, I don't know how great of a help that is for an answer to you. No, it's, um, it's helpful, because I don't want to overwhelm them, because... I've got, it's got so much ability that we're adding things and there's only so much time. Yeah. You know, his interests of his own that have nothing to do with our interests for him. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, this is very important and his ability is such that This is going to be yeah. absolutely essential someday, and it's easier now than later. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm like wrestling with I think, how I, much to push. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, if, if Caleb has a, a good understanding of English, and, and by the way, I think also understanding the parts of speech diagramming really helps people understand English. Um, you know, I think, I think for Caleb, going into it, try to understand, like, Genesis 11, this isn't something that's invented new and every single language is different. Actually, I think what Genesis is telling us, all the language is singular, and not only that, it's not just saying the same words, but saying the same language. I think that goes to the grammar of the syntax as well. And so being able to understand nominative case is what we call English subject. If he, all the grammar things that he has learned and diagramming through the years in school, is going to help them that much easier to, to learn those things because of, of what that concept is. So I, I think, you know, concepts are, are an important thing. So when I, you know, I took Greek, I don't ever remember them really talking about the fact is, okay, the nominative case, um, that's your, you know, that, that's your subject. I think it was kind of understood, but I don't remember yeah, them I don't ever saying, them that, saying that. Either. Is that, you know, the nominative case in English is the concept is kind of like the, 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 the subject of the sentence. Um, so I, I, think, I think that can be very, very helpful uh, to someone. And I think learning Greek is, is better to learn first before you get Hebrew. Because the terms of genitive, nominative, accusative in the Hebrew they use a lot of those same terms as opposed to subject direct object mm -hmm. indirect object so getting those concepts down in Greek it's an easier transition I think because you understand the Greek concepts now you can understand the Hebrew concepts are pretty similar yes you had a question or? Um, I was just going to give an, an example when when I was a, a child and my uh, brother was taking Spanish and uh, you know he tried to be all smart and just say okay well what does this mean Estados Unidos because yeah. I didn't know Spanish right <clears throat> yeah and and I said well it sounds like United States to me and it came naturally because it's just really similar yeah. but it's reversed uh, and and so you know he was just like dumbfounded. What do you you mean you understood that? And yeah. you know he he 
Yeah. What, what's very interesting in, in the languages, and this is what we call comparative philology, is that what we understand when God confused languages, what it was, it's actually referring to the lips. So we have what we call diphthongs, uh, liables, dentals, and what it means is where you, where you make the sound. Guttural is in the back of the throat, kind of the gutter way back. Whereas dental is you're making more of the sound with your teeth. Your teeth are very much involved in it. And, and so what they understand is, well, a T in Greek, the tough sound, actually in, uh, in, in, in Latin, which is the same family, I think is a V sound. So the tough sounds like a V in Latin. I think that might be the corresponding ones. But it just shows you everything goes back to it. And you can hear words in Latin and say, oh, I know what the English word is. You know, here, here's, oh, this French word, that, that sounds a lot like, because they're related. It's called the Indo-European language. And the grammar, while there are some distinctions, of, it's really concepts are all the same. And, and you just got to understand that the names they use are different. But it, is, it's, it's, it can be learned. In contrast to that example you were just giving, some languages can't say certain sounds. My wife's family, Pennsylvania Dutch, had a terrible time with my last name. Yeah. They wanted to say Werdu. And her mother could not say Verdu. Yes. And then down in Colombia, they could not pronounce my first name. They wanted to say Rafa or Raphael, but yeah. Ralph didn't work. Right. And we were just really curious. They, yeah. They could hear it, but couldn't say it. Yeah. But That's it, a good point. Yeah. It, it was interesting, your comment about the language back in Genesis 11. I'm, I made a connection. Long age of the earth, why do we still have families of language yeah. after millions of years? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah. It suggests that maybe they didn't separate that far back. That there's still these groups of like related languages. Yeah, I actually think, and, and my my understanding a little bit of the Genesis passage, and this is a little bit different. I think based upon the verb tenses there, what he's trying to say in there, because chapter ten goes back, they settled in different areas, Ham and them, and you have language there. So the kind of Genesis eleven kind of has to precede a little bit chapter ten because how it, it's kind of how they do things. Um, it seems to be that God didn't say the way I'm going to spread them is by confusing their language. I'm going to spread them, and their languages are going to ch the, the the sounds are going to change. Sure. So Indo-European, even within that language, over time the sounds became you know were, were different. The genetic pool and they were, separated. Yeah. And so, you know, the way that they started sounding, and even in the U.S. it's the same thing. Because that's the emphasis I <clears throat> use for that passage anyway, because the point isn't to confuse language. The point is they were trying to stay unified as an opposition to God. So he scattered them, and when he calls Abraham, here, you people were trying to be one or make a name for yourself. Yeah. Don't, yeah. but I'll make a name for you. And yes. he picks one guy out of that group. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of it also is that he's trying to keep them from ever doing it again. Mm -hmm. So you spread them out, and how do you keep them spread out sure forever? Right. Change their language. That's right. I laugh at the one world government, yeah. you know. Yeah, but it's fascinating that, the, like I said, in the Genesis, the passage that refers to the same uh, language is actually the word for tongue. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, the word for lips. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's what it's talking about, the representation of sounds, how things are sounded. So what I have on the handout, and this just may be something to be helpful to you, uh, real quickly, uh, we got seven minutes, we can ask some more questions. Uh, but on the last two pages, what I've done is put a lot of resources. Uh, these are all resources that I have. Um, Hebrew grammar resources, most of these, as you can tell by the date, is early 1900s and late 1800s. They're free on archive.org. You can find them free, like Google Books or archive.org, you can download them as a PDF file. These are all Hebrew grammars. And I have all of these in my, in my library. All these that I've listed, um, I think only one 
is uh, one that I purchased, and it's part of a program called Logos that I have, and that is Mark Futato, which is beginning Biblical Hebrew. Um, but everything else was free on the internet. Not all of them are on archive, but you can find them, and, and they're free. Uh, the second one I have is the Greek Grammar Resources. Uh, all of these I have. So the New Testament Greek for beginners, my first year Greek was Machen. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what was, it's not the standard anymore. They don't actually, it's out of print. Really? No one uses it anymore. Um, the other one that's good I have in my library, it's, it's a little bit more in depth than Machen is, but it's still the basic same thing, is Ray Summers' Essentials of New Testament Greek. He incorporates a little bit more concepts in the basics than Machen did. Uh, so when you got to like a genitive in Machen, he just says it's a genitive. But genitives can be used four different ways. Well, and how that is described. Five and eight case. <clears throat> yeah, that too. That's the other thing is I didn't mention that. Um, there's a lot of debate. How many cases are there in Greek? Is there five or eight? I, I believe there's eight, uh, but some say it's only five. Um, but anyway, that's that's for a whole different different story. Uh, but Summers is pretty good, and he's actually fairly recent, and he's he's a very understandable resource. Second year Greek that I had was the third one on the list, Dana and Manti. And that is actually a really good one. It does a good job after Machen. Whereas Machen doesn't break up genitives into the four. He just says, it's a genitive, here's how you translate it. Dana and Manti says, okay, it's these type of genitives. Is it subjective? Is it uh, objective? Is it descriptive? Or whatever. Uh, he kind of break, breaks it up. Uh, Daniel Wallace, um, it, he's pretty good. The problem is, He's a five-case guy, but he also kind of straddles the fence and wants to appeal to eight-case guys. <laughs> so he kind of does both. Robertson, that is an old, old book, um, A.T. Robertson's. Uh, he's very much in depth. It seems that, I mean, um, <clears throat> I really like the ones back in the early 1900s. This is some really good stuff back then. Uh, Stanley Porter, Idioms of Greek New Testament. That's pretty decent stuff. And then you have Robertson. Burton, he's more of a, a verb kind of guy. He deals more with verbal type of things. And then you have William Goodwin. Uh, many of these are free that you can get online. Some you purchase. Some can be part of Bible software. Uh, there's two Bible software ones that can be helpful. Uh, there's a lot of free ones out there. These are the two that I use. I paid for. Uh, one is Bible Works. It is purely grammar and, and word driven. Uh, syntax and semantics, what we call word meanings. Uh, Bible works, that's all it is. Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. And all that they do deal with is, is, is the, the grammar aspect and the meaning of words. But that, so that would be a really good one for interpreting if you don't have an a, a actual translation yeah. for, say, fact versus truth. And they, you don't have the same word, maybe. Yeah, it's different words, but what they do, what's nice is when you hover over the word, if you don't know the cases, the difference between what an accusative ending is or a genitive ending, if you go over it, it'll tell you it's a genitive. Now, at that point, you have to determine is it subjective, objective, descriptive, which one it is. But at least it will tell you, based upon the ending, uh, what case it is. Because the word logos, logos would be nominative, lagu would be genitive, well, you know your genitive ending. And logon would be accusative. Very good, he's got his accusative. So the ending tells you what case it is. Um, and so if you understand that, and even if you don't know the cases, it will tell you what it is. Then you can read about the, oh, we're talking about direct objects. So let me read about direct objects and how that they work in sentences. So Bible works is good. The other one, this one's really pricey is Logos. Uh, and they're more, they have a lot, they do a lot of language stuff, um, but they do a lot of commentaries and, and different things. But you can, you can still learn the same things with Logos. Uh, my primary one I use is, is I like to just sit down to begin with and just deal with the, the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic and just tear it apart from the other words that are being used and how that they're used in the sentence. And, and that's where I like to begin. I like Bible works. That's where I always begin with. And then Logos adds a lot of good supplementary stuff on reading, on grammars, and other things that you may not get in Bible works. Those are two of the main ones. But Logos will run you like $1,500. Whereas Bible works, I think, are running about $400 right now. I think it's a little bit under $400. Um, 
They're still, they're both pretty pricey. You know, I just praise the Lord that I had a good ministerial fun thing in the church to pay for these things. <laughs> you know, but let me say that don't be scared of the languages. Understand your English and see how it relates in the other languages, and you'll be able to you'll be able to do a good job with it, and you'll get better as time goes on. Um, but as you look at you know understand verbs, really weird Greek and Hebrew compared to how we think in English. But if you can understand those two aspects of it, it'll help you walk a long ways towards it.